<clears throat> all right, all right, all right. Good morning, good morning. I'm going to test this out. I'm at the Walmart parking lot. We're going to see how their Wi-Fi does. Seems to be looking good right now. I'm trying to find a good spot for my computer to sit. We're having a good time today. Hallelujah. Today, we're going to do a uh, continue our Bible review. And uh, I'm going to finish up talking a little bit more about the kings. And we're going to be talking about worshiping God. Hallelujah. Going to look at some good scriptures. And then I'm even going to teach you a little bit how to worship God. And then later I'll chop up this video. Uh, if I can figure out how to do that and make it into a couple different videos, because I think a lot of people don't know how to worship God. We're always telling you, spend time with God, uh, read your Bible, pray every day. But I think a lot of people don't even know how to pray. And that's there's nothing wrong with that in the sense that that doesn't make you a bad person. But there is we can actually learn how to do that. <clears throat> And maybe I'll chop it into a couple different videos and um, you can just come back and watch it. Give me a second to try and figure out the best way to put this up. Then we're going to pray, jump into our Bible lesson for today. It's going to be good. Amen. Hallelujah. A little update from us. Where are we right now? We are in New Mexico, Silver City, New Mexico. And... Um, Exciting. I used to, I'm sitting in the Walmart parking lot. I actually used to work at this Walmart when we lived here. I'd work overnights and it was maybe some of the hardest times of my life. Driving to work 10 o'clock at night, leaving my family behind. I'd go in and I'd stock overnight. It's a 24 hour Walmart. So there'd be people shopping and I'd be stocking the shelves and I'd see families coming in. And I'd be like, man, I wish I could just shop with my family. It was a hard time because I'd have I'd go home, I'd get off at seven, go home, and just have to figure out how to sleep during the day while the kid, well, we only had one one child at that time, while Jessica and her were doing stuff, and it was hard. But God is gracious, Hallelujah! Now we're back here as missionaries on a mission. This week we are um, doing a. <clears throat> We're, we're going for a town. It's a called, tiny little town called Hurley. And it's about 20 minutes from here. And Jessica's parents are from here. So Jessica's from this area. So ever since uh, the first time I was ever in Silver City was before I ever met Jessica in 2006. I was driving through on I-10 going to California and I had I saw signs for Silver City and I said I got to I can't be this close to Silver City and not stop. And so I went and try and block this light here. Let's see if that helps at all but um I said I have to go to Silver City and so I did. And uh, then anyways, just because from here, so ever since we got married in 2007, <clears throat> we drive up here. And every time I drive by this tiny little town called Hurley, you always see these trailer parks on the side. And there was something in me that wanted to go in there. And I never did. <clears throat> but this time we came to Silver on a mission. We came to New Mexico. We saw ourselves here. We came by faith. God gave us a divine connection in Dem Deming which is 45 minutes from here. And so next week we'll be in Deming doing a, doing outreaches there, reaching people there and working with a church, which is awesome. But we knew to come to Silver City. And then I knew, oh, I need to go to that little town of Hurley. And so on Saturday, we'll be doing an outreach there. If you're in the area, come join us. You want to give toward it? Give. I was talking with Jessica yesterday and it's going to go good with what we're talking about today. You know, everybody's giving toward something. And people think that pre they say, you know, uh, if you're just giving your money to the church, you're just giving it away. That's not true. You're giving toward an eternal cause. 
And yes, it's like filling up a car. You got to keep filling it up. You got to keep filling it up to keep the vision moving forward. But that's the same in all the world. You're doing that for something, somebody, somewhere. Most people are doing it for the NFL or for their own pension or for their own kids. And it's actually all based in the fear of dying or it's in idols that they're, they're hope that that idol makes them feel something. Watching the football game makes them feel something. Going to the baseball game, going to the mall, whatever their idol is, they're giving into those idols that are just going to perish. Or they're giving into to working all towards things to hopefully not die, but yet everybody's going to die. So most everybody's giving into something. And the world system, and this is actually what we're going to look at today. Man. I got a lot of good stuff. Um, everybody's giving into something. So anyways, say that to say, if you want to give into this, go to our website, jesusworld.tv. There's a giving option. So this week we're going to go for Hurley. We're doing some outreaches here in Silver City. We're doing one in Deming. And then next week we're going to, we're going to do the same in Deming, New Mexico. And it's exciting for me. We've always loved small towns. Every time Jessica and I would go to small towns and walk around, I I always just was just had a love for for the small towns, and even the broken down trailers here in Silver City. There's a lot of old cars, old trucks, and I don't mean old like restored classics. I mean like they they're they're they keep them up, but they're old. They're rusted, and it's so cool. Anyways. Let's look at the Bible today. Father, thank you for your word. I love you. Lord, as we look at this, at you and this word today, worship God. God, we worship you. God, we acknowledge you. You are a good God. We love you. There's none like you. I pray every single person that ever watched this, Lord, be stirred, reminded to worship you. Lord, I ask you to make yourself real even now. As they're listening, Lord, become real. Fill the room where they are, Lord. Fill the car where they are. Touch them, Lord. Speak to them, Lord. Do wonderful things today as we look at your word. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, <clears throat> we did a little lesson last week on the kings. And I want to do another one on, on the kings today. And I'm going to look at 2 Kings chapter 17. And if you read through the book of First and Second Kings, we already talked about this. So you're going to see a lot of different stories. And basically, you're going to see kings that worshipped God and then kings that didn't. And the majority didn't worship God. And things only ever got worse. And then when one would come along that actually loved God and worshipped God, it would cause... Um, restoration in the land it would cause revival in the land and good things and so we want to look at that today <clears throat> and the, the lesson is very very simple and and but it's from it god never changes and the devil never changes god is good the devil is bad god speaks truth the devil speaks lies what god has for us is good and I'm just going to say the moral of the story from the starting. If we will follow God, worship God, he has good things for us. If we will allow ourselves to be deceived and, and follow after the devil and his lies, then things go bad. That's the, that's the basics. That never changes. But we have to be reminded of that. That's ever since the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. God created man. Everything was amazing. Everything was beautiful. Everything was wonderful. They literally walked with God. And then the enemy came along. Why does he come? The thief comes only. Why does he come? He comes only. John 10.10. 10. This is one of the things that changed my life when I felt, first fell in love with God. Was What became real to me was Galatians chapter 6 says... Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap destruction. He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap life everlasting. Somehow I grew up in church and I came up with, 
I don't know how this silliness got in my brain or my mind. No one literally taught it to me, but I just had a false concept of God and the truth and how things work. Let me see how much battery power I have. It says 36 minute, 36 percent an hour, 58 minutes. Hopefully that's correct. Somehow I got into my brain. Okay, so this isn't in the Bible, but in my, in, th these are doctrines of demons. These are delusions of the devil that come in people's minds if you're not correctly taught. Somehow I got in my thinking that, okay, if I do good, that th this was grace. And I never outright said this. It's just looking back that I can understand that this is how I believed. Okay, if I do good, then it's kind of like, that's good. God is, you know, it's like you get a check mark. And if I do bad, it's okay. I'm forgiven and God forgives me. Even though those statements might technically be correct. Yes, God still loves you. God forgives you. Yes, it's good if you do good. If I do bad, I'm going to reap bad results. That's never going to change. And if I do good, you're going to reap good results. Now. Good in the flesh, that's not what I'm talking about. But good empowered by the grace of God and the Spirit of God in your life result in good things. Praise God. And it's not because, oh, you get a check mark. No, it's because you reap what you sow. You put an apple seed in the ground, you get an apple tree, you get apples, you can plant an orchard, you can prosper, you can feed a lot of people. You take a gun and you start going and shooting people up. You hurt a lot of people. You hurt a lot of families. You kill people. You're going to jail. You're going to die a death sentence. So that's not because God is good or or the or God is bad or God caused this, God caused. No, it's because what we do. As we were in Hurley the other day, and I and uh, I knew. Okay, we're we're supposed to. We're supposed to hand out flyers right here. And then I knew I turned around and said, oh, I'm supposed to park right there. And I'm pulling up to the parking spot and there's a car in front of us and there's a young man and he's cursing and all that. And Jessica's like, oh, watch out for, you know, I don't know if we should park here, da, 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 da. but I knew no, I'm supposed to park here. And when she's saying, watch out for that guy, there's something in me. No, that's awesome. I'm supposed to talk to that guy. So I went in and I, I went to that house and I talked to the guy. And I uh, found out he wasn't from there. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. You won't be here. But let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever told you God loves you? And he, he had like a, a, a check, you know, he like did this look. And I knew I'm supposed to be talking to this guy. So anyways, he, he, <clears throat> he said, well, actually, I'm the one who got shot last month. Maybe you saw it in the news. And da, 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 I'm going to make the story very short. So he knew that this was a divine appointment. I knew this was a divine appointment and I was talking to him. Anyways, long story short, I was praying for him and all that. And then he started to say, Oh yeah, you know, when that happened, my heart got hard. I'm not, I can't believe in God. Or he said, I can't believe in somebody who would do that to my homie. And I said, um, he didn't do that. He's not the one who killed your friend. He's not, we're the ones who do that. You and me are the ones who go around sinning and causing bad things. God's not the one that took a gun and killed somebody. God's not the one that organized a drug, a drug deal or a, a shootout or a, put you at a liquor store robbing somebody and then you got shot. God didn't do that. So, And he, his false doctrine that he believed, he said, Oh, well, you know, they say everything happens for a reason. Yes, of course, everything happens for a reason. Because we sow silly seeds, we get silly results. And and it's not just you're a bad person. No, it's all of us. The earth is full of ugly stuff because of all the stuff, the generations of bad seeds. So this is very simple, basic stuff. So it started in the Garden of Eden. God did good stuff. The devil comes along and deceived them, deceived Eve, said, I have something better for you. God is holding something back from you. And the lies never change. This is still the same today. Any lie that you or I fall for, any sin that we do, it's still the same tactics of the devil. The Bible says we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. 
Why? Because we're hearing this word. Why? That's why we're learning the truth. That's why we're here listening to the truth so that the truth can make you free. The truth makes you a free person because you don't fall for the lies of the devil anymore. So he hasn't changed. His tactics haven't changed. So <clears throat> it's still the same. So you had kings. So if you've been following along, we read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Now we're in, then we second, first, second Samuel, now in first, second Kings. And what did we see? We saw God moving among men. We saw God making promises. God uh, pro get, um, uh, delivering them out of Egypt. God telling them, hey, I have a promised land for you. And we talked about all these things. If you didn't listen to the lessons, go back and listen to them. God and, and we, we're putting it into us. God has a good plan for your life. God has a promised land for your life. But then last week we talked about the prosperity test. And, and <clears throat> Joshua and Moses did everything they could. Moses did everything he could to prepare Joshua, to prepare the people. He told them, hey, listen, look, remember everything that God did for us. And he said, I, I put it in a book. I'm telling it to your face. And I'm teaching you to tell your children. And I'm, I, and, and I'm exhorting you. He did everything he could, just like Peter said. I'm going to do everything I can to keep these things into your remembrance so that when I'm gone, you won't forget it. That's all a preacher can do is just preach, 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 preach. Write it, write it, write it. Tell it, tell it, tell it. Exhort, exhort, exhort. And then tell people, try and teach them how to do it right, how to stay with God. Because yesterday's victory does not guarantee today's victory. We are leaking vessels. We have this treasure in earth and vessels. Every day I need to get up and be reminded of the truth so I can walk by faith again today. It's one day at a time. It's one victory at a time. I got to walk with God one day at a time. Amen. So he did everything he could. To get them, he said, okay, remember all that God did. And he reminded them over and over all the miracles and all the tests and, and how he, he, he provided and all the miracles. And then he said, now, when you go in there, then just keep following God. That's our lesson today. Worship God. Do what he says. Keep his commandments. Stay with his statutes. And then Joshua, <clears throat> they find, they actually went in, they took the land. And then last week we talked about the prosperity test. When you actually get that, get what God's promised you, or, or you get the breakthrough you've been praying for, you get, you know, if all your prayer life is based on getting a house, then when that house comes, will you continue to press into God? When that promotion at work comes, when that deliverance, when your kid finally gets saved, Will you keep pressing into God? Whatever it is that you're pressing into God for, will you keep loving God? That's what changed my life. Was not, um, it was a relationship with a person. I fell in love with a person. That's why I never went back. Have I been perfect in the last 20 years? No. Have I have I been an idiot in some ways because I didn't know better? Yes, but I'm I've stayed in love with a person. It's all about a person. This is eternal life, is knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. It's a person. You fall in love with a person. And you stay with him. Good, bad, ugly. Paul said, I've learned, and we talked about this in the last lesson, I've learned how to abound and how to be abased. I can do all things through Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about my relationship with him. I, whether i am got a million dollars in the bank, I'm still in love with him. I still need him. I'm going to keep my relationship with him. If I have no money in the bank, I'm in love with him, and he's going to get me through, and I'm going to press in, and everything's going to be all right. But it's got to be about him. So they did everything they could. Told them, okay, when you go in the land, just keep following God. Worship God. Worship God. Worship God. <clears throat> and then there were good kings and there were bad kings. And most of them. And if you look at, if you're reading through and you almost get tired of reading. That's what I almost got tired of reading. Just the stories of, okay, this, ki this king was bad. 
and this king killed that one, and there was this conspiracy, and they killed this one, and these guys sinned, and all sin, 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 ugly, 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 until you finally get to where we're at here in Second Kings. I'm going to look at 17 today, and it's heartbreaking, but you're finally going to see Israel taken out of the picture, and then a few chapters later, Judah taken out of the picture, or... or um. Uh, occupy, taken over completely. And that's what happens with sin. You will reap what you sow. So let's look at a couple of verses in 2 Kings chapter 17. Then we're going to look at this. And so we, we're, we're seeing the destruction of Israel. God was so patient. So in the Kings, and I'm just going according to this chart back here in my Bible, but <clears throat> Saul became king, the first king of the United Kingdom in 1050 BC. Then it was David in 1010 BC. So that's 40 years later. Then Solomon for uh, 970 BC. My math might be interesting because it's backwards counting, but I think it looks like another 40 years later. So that's 80 years of the United Kingdom. And then in 930 BC, so that's just, again, the math is interesting, so it's hard to do backwards math like that. But 930 to 1050, I guess, would be 120 years of a United Kingdom. But then in 930, then the kingdom gets, gets divided. Now watch God's patience, okay? God is very patient, but <coughs> excuse me. you will eventually reap what you sow. Maybe this is the thing about sin. You might not get all of the destruction in your lifetime. And if you read through the Kings, you saw that David did some sins and then God was merciful with, with him. And he said, okay. This is what's going to happen down the line. I'm going to spare you while you're here, but it's going to happen to your kids and your ki grandkids and your great grandkids. That's worse than it happening to me. Is it happening? See, what I let flow in my life is going to flow into my kids' lives. Good, bad, or ugly. The good things, they inherit. The bad things, they inherit. Unless they find God and they, they get the mercy of God, they can get delivered and saved and all that. But I'd rather they inherit good. So I can think, oh, my sins, oh, that's okay. It's just affecting me. No, it's not just affecting me. It's going to be worse on my kids and my grandkids. So God is very patient. Look at the patience of God. So 930, the kingdom get the, gets divided. And in Israel, the first one is Jeroboam. And then everyone is evil. Every king in Israel was evil. Yehu did some decent things. He destroyed Baal, but he also did some wicked things. But other than him, the history of Israel. Now I'm talking about there's Israel and then there's Judah. Judah has its own history. And they're interconnected and they intertwine and all that. But Judah actually stayed within the line of David. And you had good kings and you had bad kings. You had a number of good ones like Asa, Jehoshaphat. Um, Joash did good in his youth, evil in, in his old age. Jotham was good. Hezekiah was good. I want to do a lesson on Hezekiah next. Josiah was good. He restored true worship. But both are eventually going to get taken out because of all the sin. Because they imitated the sin of their father. And then they, they caused Israel to sin. And then eventually God just lets them get taken over. And it's heartbreaking. But look how patient God is. Jeroboam was the first king of Israel. God gave him that him. Gave, gave, and we talked about that in the last lesson. It's the prosperity test. God gave him that place. And he promised him good things. But he messed it up. And then the, the history of Israel is, 
is full of one person killing the next one to take over and become king. There's conspiracy after conspiracy. There's suicide. There's ugly stuff. And then finally in 722 BC, so that's about 200 years later, then God lets them be taken over. So you see God's patience over 200 years. And let's look at 2 Kings chapter 17. And it's kind of like 2 Kings 17. It's going to show the, the, the um, overtaking of Israel. and But it's going to give you a synopsis of what happened. So let's just read some verses. Verse 7. So it was the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods. What are we talking about today? Worship God. What did they do? Worshiped other gods. That's what it's going to come down to today. Who are you worshiping? What are you worshiping? And is the God that you're worshiping able to save you? And here's the promise. If you'll worship the true God, he will keep you. He has a good plan for you and your children and your children's children. But if you turn away from him, you're going to reap bad results. If you worship idols, and we're going to talk about idols. What are idols? Idols are just are not just statues in, in India. The NFL can be an idol. Your job can be an idol. Your kids can be idols in your life. Anything that you like or love more than God is an idol. Anything that you're looking for your as your life source instead of God is an idol. Anything that takes the place of God in your life is an idol. So if you bow before a statue and you're getting your strength and you're worshiping a dead statue, then stop it. But probably, maybe most of you, that's not the idols you're dealing with. But you may have idols in your life. And I'm encouraging all of us to turn from that and worship the living God. We need him. Amen. And he's a good God. But we must fear him. Verse 9, the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. And they built for themselves high places in all their cities. So this happened throughout all the history of, of the, the, the kings. This is what happened in Israel. They worshipped other gods. They feared other gods. Secretly they did things against the Lord their God. What does that mean? God sees everything. But... We must be honest with ourselves. Am I really on fire for God? Am I really worshiping God? Is my life really His? And today we're going to talk about worship. And then I'm going to do a separate little video. It's going to be a 10-minute video on how to actually worship God. How to actually spend time with God. So I want you to go watch that video. But it'll... Amen? Okay, let's keep looking at this. Verse 12. They served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. What is the point of this? I want you to see that they're going to reap what they sow. And it's going to be the same in your and my life. It's the same for the nations today. If people will not worship God, then it will go bad with them. That's not uh, preaching negative stuff. That's just truth. That's not because God doesn't love you. That's just how it works. And we must have the fear of God in our lives. That's not being afraid of God. That's reverencing God. That's trembling that he's God. That's honoring that he is king. That's honoring that he is big. That's honoring that he's for real. And what he says actually matters. My kids fear me. They're not afraid of me. But they reverence that if, if daddy said something, then it's real. And I'm patient. But if they cross that long enough, they're going to find out, hey, there's a correction. That doesn't mean I hurt them. But I'm, they're going to find out, oh, that was real. God, uh, My daddy was actually serious about that. And there's a real consequence. And I correct them as young children so that they learn the fear of the Lord. 
so that they'll find out, okay, God is real. God, what God says he's meant and there's real consequences and God is, it's better to get a small correction. And then you actually, correction means you, 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 you fix your direction. Doesn't mean you're hated. Doesn't mean you're taken out of the game. It just means, oh, oh there's a correction. Whoops. I'm not supposed to go in that direction. That's the correct direction. That's a correction. Uh, uh, get off a little bit. Correction brings you back online, back online. Correction is good. I'd rather get a bunch of little corrections and actually get to my destination than never be corrected and just taken out of the game. So a loving parent corrects their children, helps them stay in the correct direction. You find out there's boundaries and those boundaries are real. God is not imaginary. God is not it is real and he's passionate. So they did what he didn't say to do. Verse 13, yet the Lord testified against Israel, against Judah by all of his prophets. Listen, and every seer. So God sends prophets to tell people, hey, 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 God is real. Hey, God's not joking about this. Hey, turn from your wicked ways. Hey, how? Worship him. You know what really changes your life is when you actually taste and see that the Lord is good. And then you keep tasting and then you get addicted to him instead of addicted to other things. That's what happened in my life. I fell in love with him. I, I got a taste and I saw, oh man, he's really good. I got a taste and I actually saw, oh, he caused me this freedom in my life. And then I just kept going and I got hooked and I got hooked and I got on fire for him. And then he started transforming me and changing me. Amen. Hallelujah. So he sends prophets. He sent prophets to testify and tell them, hey, 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 turn around. Turn from your evil ways. Keep my commandments and my statutes. Do we still need to be preaching this today? Yes. Yes. Peter was out in the streets preaching. Turn from your wicked ways. Jesus preached, repent. Jesus sent his disciples to preach, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from that. There's something so much better over here. When I found out how good God really was, all I wanted was for other people to find out, hey man, what you, he's actually really good. He's really wonderful. You should, and when you find out how good he is, you you just naturally, I'm saying naturally, uh, probably it's supernatural, whatever you want to call it, but by virtue of you turning toward him, you turn away from the other stuff and the other stuff starts breaking off. So we're here just to encourage you. Hey, God is good, man. God is good. Take a taste, take a taste and see that the Lord is good. And then I encourage you like, like, uh, um, like the, the devil does on his end. He gets people to take one taste and then he says, keep tasting, keep tasting until they get addicted. You know, often the things of the devil at first, they taste bad, but then we develop a taste for it because we saw somebody else and we believe the lie. We said, oh, I want to be like that person. So I'll just keep doing it. I'll keep smoking this cigarette until, until I finally like it. I'll keep eating this thing until I actually like it. I'll keep drinking this thing until I actually like it. And then you do eventually like it. And then you're hooked and then you get the bad results. God is the same way, except the good. If you've tasted and seen that he's good, then keep coming. If you've heard the word and you, and you spend a, even a few moments in his presence and you're like, oh, that was good. Then here's the here's wisdom. Go get more. Go get more. Go to church again. Go to another meeting. Read your Bible again. Pray in tongues again. Get that again and again and again and again and again until you're hooked and you can't go back. So that he sent the prophets. So God is just. He's so patient. He sent people. He warned them hundreds of years. See his patience? But they refused, refused, refused. And we'll see what happened. Verse 14, nevertheless, they would not hear. But watch this word. They stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. They refused to believe. I was reading this <clears throat> Proverbs 29 verse 1 with my kids the other day. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. So in 2 Kings, we're going to see their destruction, but it was long coming. 
God was so patient. But what was happening? They're stiffening their neck. When he came to, uh, he was often rebuked and hardened his neck. Uh, 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 resisting that, that correction. Uh, uh, until you get so hard that there's a sudden destruction. And to the world, it's like, oh, what a sudden destruction. But it was a long time coming. And they were forewarned. And they were warned again. And they were, God was merciful. And God, and then, and then along, somebody does repent and God is, God is so merciful. He's like, okay, because you repented, because you asked for mercy, I'm giving you mercy. And then they would turn around and keep sinning. And that's how, that's how it works. So <clears throat> we don't want to stiffen our necks. If God is tugging on your heart, God is doing, turn to him. Turn, the Bible says, turn to my reproof and I'll pour out my spirit on you in Proverbs chapter one. If God is God is, 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 is tugging on your heart, just turn, yield. He's good. He's going to help you. Watch what happened in verse 17. They caused their sons and so all sorts of wickedness. They did so much stuff. And I'm going to say this. When you're deceived, you do stuff that you don't realize how wicked it is. So to us, when we read it, you say, oh, that's so wicked. How could they do that? But I'm, I'm sharing this to challenge us. And, and, and it's obvious if you can see it in the culture around us. But there is a lot of wickedness going on. And people are so deceived, they don't know how wicked it is. But that wickedness will bring on destruction and even sudden destruction if at some point people don't repent. God doesn't want that for me personally. He doesn't want that the ramifications of that on my family or my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, the people that we minister to. He doesn't want that for your city. He doesn't want that for your school. He doesn't want that for our nation. So what do we have to do? We have to cast off our idols and worship God. And worshiping God. That's why I'm going to do an actual lesson on worshiping God. It's only going to be 10 minutes long, so go find it later. But it's real. You can actually worship God. It's not theory. Oh, yeah, I serve God. Oh, really? That's awesome. What part of your church are you part of? Oh, I don't really, I don't really go to church. Oh, oh, oh really? Oh, yeah, I love God. I, I, I really obey his commandments. Oh, really? What's he been talking to you about? Oh, well, you know, I saw this movie and uh, they said, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, oh, you get your doctrine from Hollywood. Oh, oh, really? Huh. Interesting. Okay. Let's look at that. Watch what happened here. So watch verse 17. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, slavery is actually a subtle thing. There, there's modern day slavery. Most people are actually slaves. Most people are slaves to debt, to the government, to their job, to the world, to the whole world system. The Bible says that the devil is the God of this world, small g. He's not almighty God, but through deception, he deceives the nations. Most people are sold to slavery. They sell themselves to their idols, to the government, to whatever else, instead of loving God and serving God. Verse 18, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. So it all culminates to that verse. But I showed you that it was over 200 years. And even before that, it's thousands of years of God showing himself faithful. And then prophets prophesying. And God's encouragement. And God's very own um, uh, exhortation. Hey, when this happens, don't forget me. Hey, do this. Watch verse 15. They rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he had testified. God is a good God. His covenant was amazing with Abraham. God promised them big things. God promised Abraham big things. God promised uh, Moses big things, Joshua big things, David big things. As long as they would just stay with him. 
So when it says they rejected his covenant, that's like you're married to a trillionaire who loves you, who's actually kind and gracious and patient and forgiving with you. And you reject the trillionaire to go mess around with some idiot at a bar somewhere. And then the trillionaire is like, oh, you know, it's okay. I forgive you. Come on back. You have everything you could ever need, want, desire, and you still you reject it. When it says they rejected the covenant of God, God is good. When we reject him, we're rejecting good. We're not rejecting a bunch of laws that are hard to follow. You're rejecting a wonderful person who has wonderful promises, who's rich beyond anything you can imagine, who has an amazing plan for your life. Amazing destiny beyond anything you could ever dream on your own. That's what you're rejecting. So why am I talking about this? Don't do it. Don't do it. How? Turn to him. How? Worship him. Stay in love with him. Don't fall for that stuff. And if in any degree you've fallen for it, then repent. So they rejected his covenant. So then, and uh, verse and he had warned them, warned them, warned them. We're still in 2 Kings chapter 17. So then he placed, the, the king of Assyria comes in, verse 24. And verse 25, it says, at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Now watch what happens. Very interesting things happen. So there, there's some lions that come into the land. And then somebody comes to the point, they say, hey, there's these lions are here and they're killing people. And I think it's because we're not serving the, the Lord of the, the God of this of this land. And so they said, let's get one of the priests to come and teach us how to serve this God so that we don't reap these bad benefits. And so they got this priest and the verse 28, he came and he taught them how they should fear the Lord. This is a very interesting passage. Verse 32, say, so they feared the Lord. Watch this. Watch what happened. Verse 33, they feared the Lord, yet served their own gods according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. To this day, they continue practicing the former rituals. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances. So this is a very interesting passage. Look at verse 33. They feared the Lord, yet they served their own gods. So a, a priest was brought in to teach them, okay, this is how you fear the Lord. And so they had a certain uh, religious fear of, of, okay, this is the Lord, but then they still actually did their own religion. This is not true repentance. This is not actually serving God. Verse 36, but the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power and an outstretched arm, this is what he said, him you shall fear, him you shall worship. To him you shall offer sacrifice. Verse 38. The covenant that I made with you, you shall not forget, nor shall you fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear. And he will deliver you from the hand of your enemies. Look again, verse 41. Interesting. So these nations feared the Lord, yet served their carved images. Wow, all righty. 45, I'm at 43 minutes. If you're still listening, this is good stuff. Let's try and wrap it up. What is the main point today? Worship God. Worship God. Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. It's possible. See, the nations feared the Lord, yet served their carved images. It's possible to be a Christian and yet be an idolater. And it doesn't work. We need to actually worship God. Love God. Let me read Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. <clears throat> then I'm going to read a little bit of Psalm 73. Do not be deceived by the devil. God is not mocked. What he has said will come to pass. In the world today, if people do not turn, if governments do not turn they and, and, and repent, there will be sudden destruction. 
and I'm not preaching doom and gloom, it's just reality. If people buck against it long enough, and God warns, and God warns, and God warns, they will reap bad consequences. Not for us who worship God. We'll be saved, we'll be kept, there'll be wonderful things happening in the earth, in God. But watch the deception that people fall for. Don't fall for this. Ecclesiastes 8.11 because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. It will not be well with the wicked, nor will be nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. Do not be deceived when it looks like things are not being judged. When it looks like they're just prospering and everything's great. Oh, look at those people. They uh, they look like they're having a good time. Why don't I? Why am I over here trying to live right and serve God? Why don't I just be like them? Why don't I just live for parties? Why don't I just get a motorcycle and live, you know, live the wonderful life? Let me ask you a question: Can a motorcycle gang get you healed of cancer? Can your favorite NFL team get you healed from de chronic depression when when somebody close to you dies? When you die. Can all your record, uh, uh, your Golden Globe Awards and your, your, your magazine cover on GQ and all that, will that keep you out of hell? No, none of that. None of those idols can get you healed, delivered, set free, made right, your kids set free from drugs and live right and have an actual correct good life. Idols are liars. Idols are deception. Let me read a couple things about idols. Psalm 115 verse 8. Again, what is an idol? It's not just a statue. If you worship statues, yeah, of course. This doesn't work for it. Work, it, it, they don't work. But if you worship bicycling, you could bicycling could be your idol. Yes, it's fun. Yes, it's healthy. Yes, it's not inherently evil. But if that's your whole life, that's your everything. It can't, again, I'm not prophesying that somebody's going to get cancer, but cancer is in the world. It can't get you healed from cancer. Bicycling can't get you to heaven. Bicycling won't get your kids saved. Bicycling won't get your neighborhood um, restored. But bicycling can be an idol. Bicycling can be a healthy habit. And it, but it can also be an idol. I'm just naming all sorts of things to try and get you to see. Idols is anything that you love, like, worship more than God. That you draw your strength from. That you let, that you put all your effort into. That if it was taken away, you're a dead man. If you're, if you're totally depressed because your team lost a football game last night, you have, a, you have an idol in your life. And when people talk about your idol, it will offend you. That's another way to find out it's an idol. <laughs> okay. Now here's a verse about idols. Psalm 115 verse 8. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Now watch what it, what it said about. now. So those who make idols are like the idol. Can a statue talk? Can a statue save somebody? Can a statue get delivered from an army? Can a statue? No. And if you love idols, you're like that idol. You're dead. You have no power. You have nothing. <clears throat> Watch what it said about idols. Verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. The work of men's hands. Idols are the work of men's hands. They're things that man has created that we worship. And what about them? They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, they do not see. They have ears, they do not hear. Noses they have, they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feel, but they do not walk. Idols cannot deliver me. So here's a question for you. Is the thing that you serve powerful enough 
to deliver you when you actually need deliverance. And if not, then you need to you need to turn to God. Because those things are not going to save you or your children. They might be fun for a season and they aren't necessarily evil in and of themselves to have in your life in a healthy way. But if you recognize that something is taking the place of God and all your hope and all your energy, all your love, all your worship, all your money, all your time is going into that thing, you have to ask yourself, is that thing that I'm putting all my time, effort, money into able to save me? And if not, it's an idol that's dead and you need to, you need to, you need to check your, 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 um, Priorities, Psalm 135, verse 18. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. When you trust in idols, dead things, work of man's hands to, to, to keep you sane, to make you happy, to deliver you, it will not go well. Isaiah 44. Let me wrap it up. <clears throat> then I want you to go find my lesson, because right after this, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to record a lesson on how to worship. And it's just going to be 10 minutes. It's just going to be, we're going to just going to practically teach you how to worship. So you can actually know how to spend some time with God. Isaiah 44 verse nine. Those who make an image, all of them are useless. Their precious things shall not profit. They are their own wickedness. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? Why waste time on stuff? That cannot profit. Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. So good. Let me wrap it up. Man, so good, so good, so good. Uh, I wanted to read Psalm 73. I'm not going to read the whole thing because we're going to finish up. But Psalm 73, the psalmist looks at the world and he <clears throat> and it's a it's an amazing psalm. You need to read it periodically. But he looks out and he sees people prospering and he wonders, oh, what's the point? Why am I serving God? He says they are they're doing well in their idolatry. They're worshiping other things and it looks like they're prospering. And then there's a pivot point in the uh where the the turn the table turns or the on what you call it doesn't matter verse 15 if i had said i will speak thus i would have been untrue to the generation of your children so if i would have changed my theology and said forget about serving god look let's just go be like the world let's just have fun let's just worship idols let's just just start drinking and partying and doing all these festivities and make that my life it's not worth Serving God. He said, if I would have done that, I would have been untrue to my generation. So what are we doing? We're preaching. Worship God. Turn to God. He is worth it. He is good. He is wonderful. Verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, it was painful to me. A lot of people don't understand. It looks like they're doing so well. How? What? This is painful. Watch. Here's the key. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. What happened? He went back into the presence of God. And then God helped him remember. Yeah, it looks like they're doing well. But look at their end. There will be sudden destruction. Psalm 37 is good for this as well. The meek will inherit the earth. It will happen. Do not be deceived. I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. They're brought to desolation in a moment. They're utterly consumed with terrors. <clears throat> my heart was grieved. Verse 21, I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. God, how could I be so stupid to even entertain those thoughts? I'm here to tell you God is a good God. Worship God. Verse 24, you'll guide me with your counsel. Afterward, receive me to glory. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire beside you. It's so good. 
you know, what I do sometimes is just listen to the Psalms with an audio Bible and I just repeat the Psalms. I kind of put it on half speed so that I can just repeat everything they say. These are so good things to say. Say it from your mouth. God, there's none upon earth that I desire besides you. God, I love you. 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 That comes out of your spirit. Worship God. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So he's remembering, oh, God is good. Oh, I, he's so good. Indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You've destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. That's what we just read about in Kings. And it sounds bad. You, you destroy all those who desert you for harlotry. But I showed you it, the patience of God. And I didn't tell you how many years he was patient with Israel the, after the divided kingdom over 200 years. And then Judah lasted longer because of the good kings. And I said, I'm going to look at, we're going to look at Hezekiah in the next lesson. But my math might be a little bit off. Like I told you that, that the numbers are interesting to look at because they go from backwards. But Judah lasted about another 150 years. Because at least they had some good that helped prolong it. But then eventually all the bad stacked up and taken out. So God is very patient. So when he's being patient with us, he's long-suffering. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to the knowledge of the truth. He, all, he doesn't want anybody destroyed, so he's very patient. But we're not to test his patience. You only have a certain amount of time on the earth. You test his patience long enough, you'll be gone. So instead, turn to him. Verse 28. This is some, a couple of my favorite, favorite verses in the whole Bible. It is good for me to draw near to God. The New American Standard says, As for me, the nearness of God is my good. That's what I discovered 20 years ago. I, love, I fell in love with his presence. And it's still all I want. I love him. Whether I'm in a car or in a fancy office. Whether I had a million dollars in the bank or five dollars in the bank. Whether I'm in on a stage with 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 um with uh, spotlights or on a on a, in a trailer park with two kids telling a Bible story. Only his presence is worth anything. You could be on a stage with spotlights. If you do not have God, your life is a wreck and it's a tormenting place. You could be in a poor place with three little kids that are five years old, all dirty, teaching a Bible lesson. And the presence of God is there. That's all that matters. All that matters. And his presence isn't far. That's why you can have it right now. Regardless of what's going on in your life right now, his presence is right here. Fall in love with his presence. Be like the psalmist. Go back into his sanctuary. And then everything becomes clear again. Your bank account might not change right away. The trials in your life might not look like they've changed. But it changed because you're, you're, in, you're connected to him again. That's all that matters. As for me, the nearness of God is my good. That became my, my confession. And it's real. I have put... My trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your word. God, we love you. Just make a commitment today to worship God. Father, just say, God, I worship you. God, I love you. Any idols in my life, Lord, reveal them. Take them away. Cleanse me, God. Forgive me. Give me a heart for you. A passion for you, God. I love you, God. Take my life. Do something with it, Lord. Affect, cause my life to have a lasting effect in my children, my children's children, my great-grandchildren, and beyond, Lord. Flow through my life. Keep me from wickedness. Help me see things how you see them. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Good stuff. Pray that was a blessing to you. That uh, that's again the Second Kings looked at chapter seventeen.
my next lesson, I'm going to do one on Hezekiah, and then we're going into Chronicles. And then I'm about to do a quick lesson on, on um, how to actually spend time with God. So go find that. Let me call it uh, how to spend time with God. Amen. So go find that video. Watch it. Love you. Bless you. God has a good plan for you. He's good. Fall in love with him. Amen.